When it comes to the Chola history, there were three kingdoms, Cholas, Pandyas, Cheras. There is a joke, Tamilians say, that we have never been invaded by the Northern Empires. These three were enough. They fought with each other. That's some Game of Thrones shit. Game of Thrones. New generation like you fully understand our history. Then we have a future. I'm still stuck on the fact that there was a Tamil guy talking to an Italian guy and buying wine. Hey, take this wine. First, I will give you the two Tamil words that I know. Pony Selvan and Vanakam. Okay? That's great. I think I'm meant to be with a Tamil girl. You gotta set me up with some relative of yours. Why should I set up? <laughs> hey, you're so popular. Large sections of the people who are basically artisans, farmers. And of course, the caste system was there. And uh, even in the South. Were weapons being developed constantly? Was technology being developed as well? When it comes to developing technology, you need money. There are a lot of natural resources and some of the sculpture popular even today. If the sculptures were so good, I can only imagine what the weapons were like. Exactly. There was trade with the Romans. Because we were possibly the America of that period. This is a 101 on Tamil history focused on the Chola dynasty. Right from the time we began doing conversations about Indian history, one of the most in-demand topics was the Chola Empire. I learned a lot from this podcast it's just a 101. It's an introduction to the history of Tamil Nadu. So whether you're someone from Tamil Nadu who's watching this particular episode or whether you're just an Indian, I feel it's very important for everyone to know about the greatness of this incredible Indian dynasty. This is the Chola Dynasty 101 episode with Raghavan Srinivasan. This one's for all my brothers and the sisters from Tamil Nadu. We got rags in the house. We talking about Tamil history. We talking about the history of South India. What up rags? How's it going? Yeah. Thanks so much, Ranveer. I, I hope that there's a lot I can talk about uh, Tamilian history, you know. Probably it's going to be quite interesting. I generally want the five southern states to watch my show more <laughs> because I honestly feel like the intellectualism levels in the five southern states are like a little higher than the rest. Oh, of, nice to know that. Huh? I mean, yeah. it's a little stereotyping and generalization, but it is what it is. You guys are uh, smart. You guys are educated. Okay. Please watch my podcast <laughs> uh, and learn yeah. about history with me. They talk. Uh, they do talk about Tamilians and Bengalis, you know. These yeah. are other intellectual creatures yeah. who keep on talking about uh, their own intellect. You know, <laughs> whether others appreciate or not. They, they think quite a bit about their uh, intellectual level. So nice to confirm that anyway. Yeah. That does not break their uh, illusions. So I don't think it's an illusion. You know, I, I think people all over the country have just begun to know about stories like the Chola Empire. I'm sure in Tamil Nadu, you guys have a very different perspective on it. You guys know much more about it. So of course, this is going to go to the rest of the country as well. But this one is one of those evergreen pieces that parents are going to show their kids when they want to educate them about the Cholas and Tamil Nadu in general. Yeah. But sometimes yeah, I think we get carried away by our history. Yeah? So we keep talking about Cholas, Chola Empire, the greatest empire in the South and all that. But there are a lot of commonalities eh, with, between all empires that okay. way. Okay. So when you go into the Chola Empire, uh, you can see that it is, for the first time, the, a very large empire. Large empire in the sense that it is comparable to some of these North Indian empires. Sure. You know, like the Gupta Empire. The Mauryan Empire was very huge. Cannot compare with it. But... Somewhere there. You okay. Know. Uh, at that time, it is believed to be one among the top 10 empires in the world or something like that. Okay. Uh, before we get into the actual story of it and the origins of it, why don't you draw out a picture of what it was at its peak? Because the general narrative is that it was spread all across Asia as well. Indonesia, it went up to the Philippines. Uh, from India to the Philippines, that's insane. Uh, is that the peak of the Chola Empire? Yeah, I would say so. The peak was somewhere in the 11th century. Okay, right. that is when it reached the peak. But uh, when it comes to the Chola history, you know, there are two histories. There were the earlier Cholas, okay, which you hear about in the Sangam literature, the Sangam period they call it, mm. and uh, uh, supposed to be three Sangams. The first Sangam was way, way back. They say. 
thousands of years back, but there's no record of it. So okay. when it comes to history, you have to go by records. So in that way, the third Sangam is when you get all this Sangam literature, the poems, the epics, and so on. What right? happened in Sangam 1 and 2? Sangam 1 and 2, nobody knows what happened. All that you know is that they all happened in Madurai. Okay, that was the capital city of the Pandyas. All right. And uh, at that period, there were three um, kingdoms, you can say. They were not at empires. There were this uh, Cholas, there were this Pandyas, and then there were this Cheras. Okay, the Chera is more the Kerala side. The Pandyas, south of, south, you know, south of Madurai okay. and, and around Madurai. And the Cholas were around the middle of what is Tamil Nadu now? Which is modern day what? Uh, the mo modern day uh, Tanjavur, the Kaveri River. Right. On either side of that. Right. And the right stretching up to the north. But in those times, in the Sangam period, uh, again, little bit I'll come to what is the, uh, the period what, uh, that we call Sangam period. Some people say that it started at 500 BCE, you know, mm. 500 years before the common era. Right. Some say, no, it's a bit later, but there's a lot of digging going on in Tamil Nadu, you know, and every time they dig, they keep saying that, you know, the dates have to be even pushed even earlier yeah. because they're getting all kinds of you know, pot shirts and um, uh, bronze metal uh, sculpture and things like that. So all this put together, they, it keeps pushing the dates back a bit. Yeah. And it is almost like coming to the dates of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, no? which is supposed to have taken place in the beginning of the first millennium before the common era. Okay. That is somewhere, you know, 100 BC or 200 BC. So it's slowly getting pushed back uh, for quite, uh, I think it is more or less amounting to uh, that in the sense that there is some continuity between all the civilizations in India from the mm. north to the south. Because even at that time, there was a lot of migration, a lot of trade, a lot of interaction between various peoples. So one can believe that 500 BC is not a bad date for the earlier Cholas. Okay, And that is the time when they created all this Sangam literature, the poems, that this and all that. Madurai was the capital of the Sangam, um, that uh, what is called that conference. You know, it is Sangam is a is a gathering of scholars, you know. Mm -hmm. Sangam literature is, you know, very popular. Right. And after that, there was a big gap, you know. There, there came some poetry, epics and all that. But somewhere from the 3rd century to the 6th century, nobody knows what happened or right. very little history is there. They are still trying to reconstruct something. It was It is called the Calabra period in Tamil we say Kalapirar. 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 Okay. Pirar. Pirar. So they are a, they set up a kingdom. Okay. Some say it is a Buddhist kingdom. Some say it is a Jain kingdom. Uh, so there is a lot of, that is supposed to be a black period, but black for whom? You know, I don't believe that it is really a black period. As maybe, in, maybe for this anti-Buddhist, it could have been a black period. In Sangam literature, they describe a dark age. No, it, this is after Sangam literature. Okay. Okay. Sangam the, literature stopped somewhere, let us say, the second or third century of the common era. All right. And from the third century to the sixth century, there is a black spot, a black hole. Game of Thrones is going on. Something is going on. Some right. war. Some uh, war and everybody reports it as, you know, they, they don't know what's happened. It's a, it's a kind of a, a, a black period. Okay. But it, it doesn't appear so. Because literature was kept developing. Okay. And uh, the Buddhists and Jains were taking a lot of interest in that region because uh, Buddhism, when it started spreading, and Jainism, when they started migrating to the south, because in the north, they were sort of losing popularity. Okay. So they started migrating south to the south. And a lot of influence was there at that time in Tamil Nadu. Unbelievable. Okay. Today you cannot see that kind of influence, but there were hundreds of Buddhist monasteries. There were hundreds of Jaina, um, uh, what they call the, the 
Sangams and the temples. Okay. Okay. So, at that period in time, something happened. Then, the sixth century starts. Okay. From the sixth century, again there is a kind of a revival. Everything, all these earlier Pandyas, Cheras, Cholas, and all disappeared. Okay, during that period. Okay, they all got scattered. Some went to. Andhra, some went to Kerala, and all that they got scattered. So when it came to the sixth century, the Pallavas from the north, they originally came from the Telugu belt. They came down to the south and around near Chennai and what is called Kanchipuram now, they set up their empire. That was their capital. Okay. It was basically North Tamil Nadu. They set up their capital, became very powerful, and then slowly grabbed. Quite a bit of land as they advanced to the south. So at that point in time, they were the most powerful. Okay. okay. Do you not want to talk at all about the Pandyas or um, the the Cheras? Cheras. Yeah. Um, like I mean, who were these people? Like these were just kingdoms that sprouted up. They were just kingdoms, and because at that period in time, when you look at five hundred be- years before the Common Era, everywhere in India, you can see kingdoms are sprouting. You know, okay. There, from the tribal uh, period, there was a bit more organization. States were coming up, mm. an army was there. You know, but it was still a kingdom in the sense that they were not very. The state was not that powerful. It didn't sure. have a military going everywhere. So, is it fair to say that uh, when the transition of humans happened from tribes to actual townships, right? Uh, the Pandyas, the Cheras, uh, and even and the Cholas, the Cholas set pro- up these kingdoms. Okay, okay. So, they must have come from the tribals anyway. So earlier there must have been a lot of tribal chieftains and mm. all that. And at one point in time, they became Pandyas, Cheras, and Cholas. I think they were probably the most powerful tribes. Yes. Okay. Very much, very and much. Must have been many <clears throat> more tribes, but these were the three that really broke out. Then exactly. there was a dark period where no one really knows what happened until the, about the sixth century. Okay, and all this these three kingdoms were had vanished. Okay, and a new kingdom came up called the Pallavas, who were not there earlier. Okay, and that period belonged to them. That you know, from the sixth century to the ninth century, literally. They were dominating Tamil Nadu, and all these Cholas, Pandyas, Cheras were there, but scattered. They had some regional kind of satraps. Okay. Um, they were trying to gather around, but basically they were uh, sort of sub or you know supporters of Pallavas this way and that way. Weakened. They yeah. were very weak. At they this were point. very weak, so, and the yeah. Pallavas used them. They sometimes the Pandyas sided with them, the Cholas sided some other time. So the Pallavas were the dominant force. They even went up to Lanka and briefly uh, conquered uh, northern uh, the northern part of Lanka. So they were the dominant force at that period in time. Okay, I will come back to your timeline, but yes. this is just for my understanding. When you talk about people like Raja Raja Chola, that's the one Chola. Emperor, who everyone's heard of, right? This is post this entire period. Post the entire period. Okay. They don't belong to the Sangam period. All right. They are post Sangam, post this Kalabra period, and again they regrouped, and uh, they came up as a powerful force somewhere in the ninth century when the Pallavas oh. had already become big. They slowly you know, pulled the ground from under them. They they were initially. Siding with the Pallavas in wars against the Pandyas, but at one period in time, the Pallavas were weakened. They took over everything. They subdued both of them, the Pandyas and the Pallavas, set up their empire in the middle of Tamil Nadu, and became a very powerful force. That's some so, Game of Thrones shit. Game of Thrones. Oh, right. This is going on, right? <laughs> it is going on, and okay. uh, uh, there, there, there is a joke, you know, that. Uh, Many people in in the Tamilian say that we have never been invaded by the Northern empires. Neither the Mauryan Empire came up to that, or even the Mughal Empire. They came, some forays were there and went back. Gupta Empire they didn't come up to the south. The South Indians and the Tamilians are happy that you know they could not dominate us, but. These three were enough. 
they fought with each other they were busy with each other so there was no need for anybody to dominate them you know they were just all, all the time at uh, logger heads with each other sometime the pandyas will come up sometime the cheras will come up sometime the cholas will be there so it was a game of thrones literally i would assume that if they are at war with each other all the time they actually weakened in order for a northern force to enter and take over one would say that but uh, looks like there was some problem you know they were uh, maybe strong enough to when things came to that uh, point when there is a northern invasion probably they regrouped got together or they were fairly strong even uh, even independently and and also one more thing is that while there were three of them were fighting with each other at any one point in time there was a dominant kingdom or a dominant empire right right so either the pallavas were dominant and nobody could you know they they could go up to the north and defeat uh, the chalukyans and beyond and uh, rajaraja chola is believed to have gone up to even you know beyond the ganga yeah let's talk a little bit about war like a little pause from your timeline yeah. i understand that when it comes to the subject of war the winner of war usually has technology on their side and or intelligence yeah it's usually a combination of the two so strategy right. as well as technology right. like you study any winning emperor it's always technology and strategy uh when you talk about all these kingdoms were they a warrior oriented culture like was that that like were weapons being developed constantly was technology being developed as well yeah see when it comes to developing technology or having a standing army you need money right you need resources so firstly a period comes a point in time comes when you have some surplus and that surplus comes from expanding agriculture you have a lot of you know new land you bring in you have enough to eat food is there then you are strong you are you are stable then around agriculture develop a lot of this artisanal work there is a lot of you know um craftsmanship and people move from villages to towns they become craftsmen they learn technology they slowly start working on metals and things like that then your military equipment starts coming when you are when you have mastered the use of metals we have a surplus to spend and you have a sort of political stability then you can build a military because military is very important for a state to exist you know to, for a for for that to be some kind of a, a regular a stable uh, government and all that and that happened in the pallava empire because they had a large tracts of land they developed technology and some of their sculpture like both stone and bronze sculpture are you know even popular even today you cannot excel that if same the, way with cholas yeah if the sculptures were so good i can only imagine what the weapons were like exactly right okay. so they could develop that kind of thing they could have a standing army uh, and uh, trade developed a lot because they had these things to sell they made this objects and things like that so one thing develops into another right so when you get into trade and when you start uh, trading with uh, foreign countries then you have to defend your shores mm. you have to have a fleet you have to have naval technology you have to learn the seas so all this happened quite a bit in the pallavan empire okay because they traveled a lot they imagine they went up to sri lanka right not only by land but by uh, waterways so bit of a stupid question okay but now india is a big landmass uh what was it about tamil nadu that made it that rich uh it was uh, the rivers were it was river fed uh, area like okay. the ganga right. you know the civilizations settled down around the rivers okay. so the jangetic plain is a populated area where all the cities northern cities came around the on the either side of the banks mm. so same way in tamil nadu there were lots of rivers kaveri and you know for the south there were rivers in the in the north now some of them are dried up but there is, there is a huge riverine tract of land where you can grow things okay. around around which villages got built towns came you know and then cities started all the cities are located on river banks so and the river transport 
was there also helping okay um you know the modern day context of an empire making money is when someone finds oil or someone finds like fossil fuels or natural resources yeah. uh you become rich as a country right i'm assuming that in this period when you have a lot of land that can be farmed you yeah. become rich that's what yeah. actually creates rich money and immediately using that there was a, there were a lot of re- natural resources you know there are a lot of metals like uh-huh. iron ore was there they could uh, smelt copper so copper technology bronze iron all this developed one after another a lot of cotton so the textile industry developed weaving developed into a very fine art right so there were a lot of uh, even um, say 2000 2200 years back there was trade with the romans in and, the uh, in tamil nadu in tamil nadu in in the south all the southern ports were trading with the romans so, so there, there were ships that left italy went were, around africa and came to imagine, tamil nadu imagine they went through the mediterranean and came to kerala the kerala coast the southern tamil nadu and the even the eastern ports so all these are recorded by the greek um travelogues and travelers they have recorded that these are all the ports that we used to come to and uh, this this has been discovered by a lot of roman coins and uh, uh when tamil nadu gave textiles and uh, you know jewelry probably stones gem stones and all to rome they also imported a lot of wine so you can still uh, archaeological finds are there of wine caskets uh coming from all the way from rome damn they right? go so these are all uh, people are the, the kings were living uh, a high style of life it's, we it's, don't know about the people yeah but oh, don't uh, know about the people we no we we don't know what about the people i'm saying like okay. they 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 are just you know you can imagine that uh, they are artisans weavers they were all you know so they were living a life of hardship i would imagine because why would that the trade finally benefits only certain sections so the traders grew rich the kings grew richer they could build palaces they could build temples if you look at history the the way it is documented and and uh, the findings from various archaeological studies as well as from the texts from the coins from inscriptions and all that you can see that there were definitely a a wealthy class and a, a large sections of the people who are basically artisans farmers uh, either farmers with small amounts of land or landless labor so they were all there and of right. course the caste system was there oh and, even uh, even in the south okay yeah so there were uh, you know the the parayas the people who are living outside the village in uh, uh, camps there were people who uh, were tribals and uh, who settled down on the outskirts of towns and slowly got into agriculture so these are all you know sort of peripheral uh, castes you can say who are actually outside the town and inside the town too there were there is a lot of uh, discrepancy there are quarters you know there is workers quarters there are quarters for nobles and uh, so it's all it's it's like anywhere in india i would say you know divided into castes and rich and poor there were wealthy sections in the cities so when cities are described in uh, poems you can see that there were sections in which uh, traders lived and which uh, nobles lived which fishermen lived and uh, the carpenters lived so there are quarters i'm still stuck on the fact that there was a tamil guy talking to an italian guy and buying wine exactly. hey take this wine <laughs> and then this guy is like selling gemstones yeah that's funny really you know how how they would have talked because the sangam poems describe colonies of greeks you now they call them yavanas what uh, yavana is really a foreigner you know even in in the north like a white boy. generally generally call them uh, all foreigners as some any non indian you call them yavanas so here it is all greeks and uh, probably uh, quite a bit from africa quite possible 
So there are a lot of Greeks and uh, sailors and uh, traders who actually settled down in some of these cities. Because we were possibly the America of that period. Exactly. That is right. And everyone was looking for, you know, this was, yeah, that is, that is one thing we have to look back and learn from history. It was the America of one period. Everyone was flocking to these ports and these cities. Uh, it's one of my joys of podcasting with subject experts like you. Uh, so I'm just going to throw my very boyhood oriented questions to you. Tell Definitely. me about like that timeline again, sir. Like you said that uh, there was a period where they were warring with each other. And then the Cholas sprout up. Am I right? You said that yes. though, Pallavas were in power, but the Cholas kind of took power Cholas away came, from them. Yeah, they became a big power. And in historical records or you know I mean when you actually view the story of history were the Cholas the standout most powerful empire that Tamil Nadu ever saw I would say that yeah if okay if you take empires which sort of uh, generic to that area to that country then the Cholas were the most powerful among all the empires that Tamil Nadu had seen coming from its soil sure okay? and uh, Vijayanagara Empire can be compared to that, but it was supposedly from the north, northern uh, region of what is Tamil Nadu now. So, if you go strictly by Tamilian standards, the Cholas are the Tamil, even that there is a controversy that Cholas came from the Telugu country. Okay. You know, but anyway, I'm not going into that <laughs> thing. Do, yeah. do young Tamil guys and girls actually discuss the Chola Empire? Uh, there is a, there's quite a bit of uh, Sangam literature and this empires and uh, uh, various epics and all taught in schools. I okay. know that when you, if you get into a Tamil medium and English Tamil, you know, you are in a Tamil country, you have to, uh, Tamil is a language. It's a second language for English medium schools and the first language in Tamil schools. So there's a lot of heavy stuff you know, written in archaic Tamil, right. which you have to mug up and, uh, and uh, you know, write in the exams. But I would, I fear that it is all mugging up. You know, one doesn't really understand the history. Okay. Okay. So whatever I, little I know, like you said, I am contributing to history. I am very, very humbly. I am just, you know, at the periphery of sure. uh, this historical debates going on. And, uh, I'm I, I'm trying to look at a few aspects. All right. So there is a lot and lot of things that we have to say about our history. There is a pressing need, I would say, that history is taught well, taught in an interesting way, and new generation, generations like you, fully understand our history. Then you know we have a future. Rags. I don't yeah. think it's going to be taught in schools in that fun way. Honestly. Yeah. I mean, when you actually look at how the education system works, it's going to take a long time for history to be taught in a fun way. Yeah. So our only hope is the Ranveer show <laughs> and other yes. podcasts and other podcasts it, like this. It, it requires a lot of effort. It can be done. Okay. It, uh, there is a lot of interest now, if you see, like I was telling you about my son who bunked history classes. Right. He will come home and open up the Wikipedia and uh, study about various things. He will read uh, books. You know, some of this, the... Recent authors write history in a very uh, fun way, in a way you can um, understand. Way. Not, uh, mm, yeah, but but uh, it's quite authentic also because history, again, you have to be sort of, it's a science, right? You cannot take too much leeway. You have to be careful. You have to, you, you, you have to write it in a way that's interesting. At the same time, not swerve too much from what is what is the reality right you know so there can be a lot of debates on history you know something happened didn't happen which is the most, more powerful empire what happened on that particular date chronology of kings mm. there can be debates mm. but all of them have to be based on uh, factual information factual evidence okay of history correct my pronunciation yeah uh, first i will give you the two tamil words that i know Ombudupatta. <laughs> that means 9 and 10. Oh, right? Ombudupatta. Uh, anyway, uh. That's, that's the maximized limit of my Tamil. <laughs> okay. Now, and Vanakam. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I know three words. Yeah. Secondly, hmm. Pony Selvan. Am I saying it right? Uh, right. That's correct. All because of the movie. Yeah, you are telling me My that. pronunciation was right? Yes, yes, yes. Do you meant to be Pony with a Tamil Selvan. girl in life? 
That's why my Tamil comes naturally. Oh, okay, okay. No, I'm, I'm so now, now there is some pressure on uh, you, you know, learning to a set few me things. Up. <laughs> <laughs> Got to yeah. set me up with some relative of yours. And definitely, yeah. I'm a you? married, married, <laughs> not married, a marriageable boy. Half, uh, okay. I'm an eligible Somewhere bachelor. There. Okay. Would sure, you would sure. you really set one of your Tamil girls up with me? Definitely. But you wouldn't want that, to set up. Uh, why why should I set up? <laughs> You're so popular. You just have to tell. You know, you you. Uh, after this show you must be getting a lot of you know not letters from emails uh, uh, um, okay it's it's, it's a lot of uh, you know maratha warriors because we've done so much chatrapati shivaji maharaj yeah. stuff it's a lot of punjabis because mm. of my face <laughs> and uh, okay uh, it's a lot of bengalis no no i have no complaints <laughs> but no no tamilians no no with your ombod patte and vanakkam you won the hearts of oh, my tamil God. girls okay now you can expect a, a huge Uh, a bombardment meant coming from tamil nadu I so, so. the it's good good uh, <laughs> you know i like it that you want to learn you know you are really oh. eager uh, anxious to know about uh, tamil history a lot to learn a la- lot of things there are a lot of translations available you know, one doesn't really need to know tamil you can appreciate all the south indian history and literature and poem poems and by reading commentaries right. by reading uh, translations good translations are available so was pony selvan a nice a movie hit or not uh, no, okay. was, was it a hit or not and was it appreciated was it a correct depiction of the chola empire i liked the movie because uh, it was very fast paced you know and it was trying to tell a story of five volumes the original author had written in compressed into two hour or two and a half hour two films right pony and selvan 1 and 2 so the the director obviously had a lot of problems because it's a huge story and so many interesting events the original which was written by kalki you know is a prolific writer very fantastic novelist at some point in time you learn tamil and try to read those five volumes you will really appreciate one of the best among among i would rate him as among the uh, novelists the best novelists in the world okay after this movie the he got to be known as somewhat better right otherwise people didn't know that there was one kalki who had written this thing so right. the movie made that popular movie made even the cholas popular okay so all said and done i would say that the movie is not really true history of the cholas okay? why it is a novel oh okay. it is made out of a novel and the novel has lot of twists and turns the hero of that novel is raja raja chola okay but the novel stops the entire novel covers a period up up to his becoming the crown prince he is not at the king it is only up to his young age when he becomes the crown prince and it is all a lot of love affairs and uh, war and you know so lot of things pulled into the novel the to game make of it thronesy yes okay and uh, yeah a lot of uh, um sajish going on between <laughs> various uh, things so they it is like a lot of uh, it's interesting to read but it is not history okay. see when when you talk about history you know a novelist can take a lot of uh, leeway that's sure. fine you know it, you don't blame the no, novelist is not telling you i am writing history he's not telling that he's saying i am writing a story right so but somebody cannot r- read that and say this is history and therefore stop uh, learning about raja raja chola if so, if some someone has read vandi ponni in selvan and says i know all about chola empire no, he, he cannot know teaches all about chola empire so the chola empire is uh, you know firstly it was an empire with uh, several kings and it started somewhere in around the middle of the 9th century 850 there was a king called vijayalaya chola who first set up the empire there Did- were there were cholas before him but he is the one who really set up a capital started the empire what's his origin story tough guy he is a tough guy quite maneuvering guy he played the pandyas against the pallavas 
and gained a foothold in that region uh, on the kaveri sure. area and slowly set up he was only a chieftain then slowly became a uh, he was given land and and all that and finally he defeated the pallavas who with whom we was dealing all the time whom he was helping in the war so first uh, he defeated the pandyas with the pallavas as the bigger power mm. pallavas got weakened pandyas got wiped out so then vijayalaya chola set up the empire and that is how empires are set up right it's just you keep watching where to you know what is abiding for your time what happened to the pallavas completely wiped out pallavas got completely wiped out as in they were killed they are the last king was killed uh, and after that they became um, chieftains to the chola empire okay right there mm. was there was a line after that but they were all uh, sort of small they were given small parcels of land sure. and they were called pallava kings but really they were not kings it was the chola empire dominating everywhere so these after 850 So came a set of kings and finally Raja Raja Chola. He came became emperor. It's one his, bloodline. Like it's the, one bloodline, yeah. Okay. Father and all that, and okay. and cousins and things like and that, uncles and you know. They married Tamil girls or they married like people from outside they as well. They married uh, people from the surrounding region, not 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 uh, North Indian girls. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they got any any. Uh, <laughs> so there was certainly not a Rajasthani girl or uh, or, or even a Oriya girl. Okay. Uh, I could say that he had about fifteen wives, because that is the time when uh, kings have minimum fifteen wives. Because uh, political, yeah, they have to make political deals. And But all fifteen were from southern states. Were from the southern uh, states, yeah, north, uh, west. Slightly, what, yeah. slightly. What? What, sir? Right. Uh, maybe one from Lanka. I don't know. Lanka. Uh, what was happening? Lanka was anyway his territory. You know, they conquered Lanka also. What was happening in Lanka at that time? There was like separate kingdoms and all. Yeah, Lanka has always been separate. Has a separate history. Never really part of India. Mm. Though the southern kings uh, captured Lanka and kept Lanka for. Maybe even hundred years, right? Sure. The Cholas had uh, dominated Lanka for almost a hundred years. So, but still, it was uh, a kingdom of, on its own, and then later on became independent. And uh, so that is again a story of how kings capture other lands. Uh, Raja Raja uh, went to Lanka, destroyed a city called Anuradha Pura. It was a very ancient city there. Set up his own capital. and started ruling and his son and grandson ruled for quite a while till a lankan king came back and reclaimed that one second so we got to rewind a little bit what was the first chola king's name vijay vijay vijayalaya vijayalaya yeah so after him all his sons and descendants right. just kept making the empire more powerful more powerful they expanded in terms of land yeah and i'm assuming they focused on agriculture made money right. focused on technology to defend themselves etc yeah. so progressively it's getting stronger When does Raja Raja Chola appear? Yeah, he is uh, like I said, uh, he was a prince, okay, and uh, he is really in nine eighty five he became a king. Nine eighty five. Yeah. Okay, that so that's is, like uh, almost end of tenth century. One thirty five years after uh, Vijayala. Vijayala. All right. That's right. So and four, then three, four uh, he died in thousand fifteen, and uh, his son took over Rajendra, and so on. Okay. That's a long so, tenure, very long tenure among the among the longest empires. Maybe you know even longer than the Mauryan Empire. Maybe as long as the Mughal Empire. I I really don't know, but it was a very long empire, mm. and uh, <clears throat> some three centuries together, and they held it together. Right, very powerful. Almost uh, south of Narmada. the territory belong to them why is raja raja chola the hero in the whole chola dynasty story yeah in spite of all this king it is he when he came to power actually expanded the chola empire to almost the maximum all others who came later used that dominant position but he was the one who waged wars across you know left and right north and south 
aggressive guy aggressive guy every year every month every year he went and subdued somebody or other he whole of kerala he brought under his rule whole of andhra he brought under his rule lanka he brought under his rule sent a emissary or a commission to china started trade with uh, this uh, all this southeast asian empires you know so, the, these are the kind of historical figures i find fascinating because even when you talk about someone like vijayala you said that he had a few schemes and plots he ran with the pallavas and pandyas so it's usually the same story about how someone ascends to power yes. but then when a prince is already born in a palace with a kingdom around him how does that prince become aggressive enough or ambitious enough to expand more what's gone on his in his childhood yeah that is true like he had a, a definitely an empire already there but then uh, the cholas also went, went through lots of ups and downs okay and uh, by that time his dad was there and uh, before that they had lost quite a bit of territory because the northern uh, the chalukyans oh. and uh, the other uh, kings called the rashtrakutas so they got together and started getting into chola territory gotcha so in between a little bit it it uh, sort of contracted but when he came to power raja raja and in fact even before coming to power as a prince he had gone to the battlefield and you know so he is uh, quite a warrior and uh, he has uh, many battles to speak about so war oriented so by that time war oriented he built a war machinery he built a ship building industry industry and all these other industries also flourished um textiles and all trade expanded uh he captured all the some of the western ports also like the kerala the muziris which you might have heard one of the oldest ports these ports are all active uh, right from the roman empire and before mm. when the greeks came like when mm. uh, alexander was invading the north his ships were doing trade the greek ships had come to the south okay. so that part of the sea was mastered by both you know and imagine ships going such long distances you know mm. and then after a long period you hear columbus starting uh, you know to discover india and getting lost mm. so but these people the seafarers had already mastered the sea and they knew they were just going from the western coast of india to africa like you know every month you make a trip and this side from the eastern coast ports they go to the southeast asian countries so it was like like um a trade route a well established trade route child's play for them to go to these countries and come back what was the logic behind going to southeast asia but because i don't think any other indian emperor has truly thought of that everyone was just on the subcontinent some info would have been in i'm assuming it was raja raja chola who expanded to southeast asia yeah his son rajendra his son. yeah okay so probably the father takes over his area and the surrounding set areas the, set up for the son and he told know. the son that you know i'm better than you you won't amount to anything in life the son had daddy issues so said you know what i'm going to yeah. expand into that other country as well this. you have conquered everything in the land now i have to go across the sea you know that's right so sorry, father done the work getting on emotional so yeah. sorry i'm kidding <laughs> go on <laughs> yeah so the sun started you know uh, expanding the fleet further but what uh, what existed in like indonesia and malaysia and all these places back then see they were trading with uh, they were also trading nations there was one sri vijaya empire there and uh, i don't know before that there were empires and uh, you know it was a sort of a prosperous region Okay. Right? They had their own uh, thing, and they were uh, dealing a lot with China. And China right. being, you know, bigger power than India, and you know, or at least as big a power as India, was trading left and right with all the countries. Even at that period in time, there was a Silk Route. So it's a huge empire, resources, big market. So the Southeast Asians were dealing with them. The Southern kings wanted to have a slice of that pie. You know, we keep talking about European imperialism. How European countries went and colonized other countries. Here's an example of Indian imperialism. Yes, only except that uh, 
they conquered the trade routes and they really didn't make them colonies. The British came here and made this a colony and then, you know, they were here for some 250 years. But the none of these Indian kings really went, even Lanka for that matter. Mm. They didn't conquer it. They didn't colonize it. They were there for a while. And it was a military expedition, no doubt. But uh, same with Chinese. You know, they didn't go and colonize uh, other countries. They sent, they had huge fleets. They sent ships in hundreds and thousands. But then all that they were bothered about was conquering the trade routes, not the foreign colonies. <clears throat> India is different. India they considered as, you know, my country. Mm. I can conquer, I can colonize it, but not outside. Okay. So there was some kind of probably a rule. Some Do you think there was a religious angle? that expand Hinduism into these countries? Because where uh, do all these uh, temples in Bali and all that come from? Uh, I would say, see, religion is always there because when a king conquers a country, they impose their philosophy, their religion, their culture, everything they impose. Like that is why I was talking about the British earlier. When you conquer some somebody. You have to conquer their mind. It's not enough to conquer their land or their, you know, physical assets. You have to conquer their mind. But the Indians, the at least the Chola Empire, there's not much evidence. They went and built, they had these trade relations. They sent their army, no doubt. They defeated them in a war. They put up their own uh, sort of uh, what you call their puppets there to control that market. And in that process, a lot of Tamilians and a lot of Indians also settled there. Oh, okay. You know, the traders, mm. like the way the Greeks settled in Tamil Nadu and, you know, there were colonies of Greeks walking right. in the market and talking in Greek. Tamilians must have walked there in the market and talked Tamil. Mm. and built one temple like the way Tamilians built temples in the US now. So they must have built their temples there, that sculpture and all that. But today and even at that time, the dominant religion there is Buddhism, you know, and that went from India. And that did not get sort of imposed by a king. Ashoka had sent all his even his own son and daughter he sent to spread Buddhism. He sent a uh, emissaries to all the countries. But he was not directly controlling any country to impose a religion. Sure. It just became popular by itself. Mm -hmm. So much so that today, we don't have that much Buddhism and Jainism in uh, the country. But you have other countries which are Buddhist mm -hmm. countries, you know, outside India, who had nothing to do with when Buddha was alive. What was the religion of the Cholas? Hindu? At that point in time, there was no religion called a Hindu religion. There were various sects, you can say, uh, various beliefs. Okay? okay. So in Tamil Nadu, there were the Buddhists, the Jains, there were Vaishnavites, there were Saivites, and then there were many of these other fringe groups called uh, this, <clears throat> that Shakta tradition, Shakti. Tantra. Uh, the, the Shakti tradition, uh, ho holding Shakti as the, sure. as the biggest, you know, the, the goddess. So there were, there were many cults which, um, which uh, sort of worshipped goddesses. Goddess-driven cults were there. And that tradition comes from tribal times, you know, in Tamil Nadu. They were, even in the Sangam period, in poetry and all, you see, there were a lot of goddesses, uh, female gods, who dominated uh, the thinking, the culture, and everything revolved around that. They were given special place. So one would, one might say that women were revered in uh, the church, the Chola country, an earlier country. But then coming back to what uh, you asked about the religion of the Cholas. Uh, they were Shaivites. Okay. But that doesn't mean they encouraged Buddhism also. They built monasteries for them. And they encouraged Vaishnavites. 
they built temples for them mm. so it was a kind of secular i would say in the sense that believe in everything and uh, go with the um, the crowd go with the current thinking so at that time the shaivite um, trend and the vaishnavite trends were very strong in tamil nadu mm. so they went with the flow they built temples of you know shiva temple that big temple at uh, tanjavur was built by raja raja chola and it was a shaivite temple so he uh, gave a lot of contribution to temples in general i would say but you cannot bracket him as you know he is this or that religion okay. or this kind of thing they sort of try to maintain a balance with all the yeah. what was his son's name again rajendra rajendra who expands to southeast asia and yes. basically makes the chola empire even richer even richer that's true and even more broader and true why did uh, kalinga come into mm. the picture kalinga's orissa right mm. right so how did this game go to orissa then because the kalinga empire was also powerful and if we tamilians feel that our uh, history is uh, the tamilian or the south indian history is not that well known the kaling the orissa people are even you know they they say that nothing is known about our empire which is such a great empire mm. so the kaling empire was really great from the time of ashoka but very little documentation you find on what what's happened in the orissa's history the kalingans had an edge over the tamilians in terms of sea faring sea trade really yes because they they had ports natural ports and the climatic conditions were better there so they could take away some of the trade of the cholas okay so they came into conflict with them so and uh, with the southeast asian countries they were also trading at that time and trying to dominate so that the war was sort of over trade routes and money over trade routes and a control over the southeastern trade route which was very crucial for trade with china and the cholas won the war they won the war that's what they say they won the <laughs> war <laughs> they won the war uh, in general but uh, but fine, they they could not conquer kalinga they came back you know they the area remained the same so that is again one uh, thing of who won who lost you know when you in history when you talk about what is real history what happens is that history is written by the ruler right the king writes his own history it says i won the war and he calls a few poets to his uh, palace and says sing about my victory mm. so they write poems we read those poems and then really believe ha this fellow really won you know because there's no other evidence you know there's no inscriptional evidence or um, of course coins if the chola coin had gone to some place you know it has gone there to that place because either there was trade or they had conquered that place if chola had built a temple somewhere then you know yeah they have gone they have gone there they built temples in uh, lanka they built temples even in cambodia right so you believe that yeah they have gone there but from poetry you cannot believe right because poetry is written by like they say in the sangam poems you know the kings used to there are a lot of bards poets who come to their palace every day and whenever there is war before war after war they write lot of poems mm. you know it is just to give encouragement and that corpus of poems have come to us and when you read those poems you will think that these tamilian kings were you know unbeatable the most powerful okay there is some chronology there also but then the sangam poems also tell that for every verse that a bard writes about a king they get a golden coconut huh na coconut made of, made gold. of gold gold ah nice okay. so the poet sits in the assembly and sings one lovely poem and the king takes one golden coconut and rolls it to him and says one more so were there, were there uh, and it was a stupid question okay but when i visualize the chola empire based on everything i've heard and learned of the show i visualize a lot of gold as well 
So yes. were there gold mines in Tamil Nadu? Is that why there's so much gold, or it was because of the trade? It was because of the trade. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so much so that when the Romans bought uh, cotton textiles and gems and and all that, so they used to make uh, jewelry also here with the gold. So gold was imported and along with wine, and uh, the exports were all kinds of material cloth particularly. and uh, spices a huge spice market mm. which is very valued in uh, rome so much so that the roman the augustus caesar started crying saying that my treasury is empty all gold has gone to india because these people just buy spices and they buy um Uh, cloth and linen and and all that so actually there was a drain you know what you call now today you talk about a foreign exchange drain the other way no mm. india paying for export now uh, in that period it was reverse india was exporting a huge amount of goods and gold was coming in so we were truly the america of that period is uh, truly okay and uh, between china and uh, the uh, if you take the 17th 18th centuries china and india together if you add their gdps it was something like uh, 60% of the world's gdp mm. these two countries had i think the big geopolitical lesson from the entire chola dynasty is uh, an economic stronghold in your own country as well as the constant need to expand business outside the country yeah that's what i've gained from this whole episode that's right honestly and to remain a king to maintain your empire you have to be at war you have to keep on expanding otherwise you are gone finished yeah or so, at least be very rich yes you have to be very rich but not uh, that kind of uh, decadent rich mm. because uh, that is what the indians became when the british came right? decadent rich as in we were, got spoilt <laughs> right yeah yeah that's right we weren't tough anymore we weren't tough and uh, yeah sort of lazy life you weren't enough who is that to conquer us you know we have so much money mm. who is that guy who has better arms than us you know you start believing in that kind of thing not only that what is important is that when the kings fight with each other and there's a decadent rule people are up in arms against them no they they are not happy so when somebody comes even they are they sort of uh, uh, you know they don't care mm somebody rules people are you know not at all passionate about uh, you know this something we have to defend this and the kings keep fighting and what but what the people want is that they that hatred against the that particular rule is what you know at that point in time that becomes the most important thing and uh, so that is very important uh, for a for a king to maintain uh, law and order and uh, you know rule okay raghavan shrinivasan sir thank you this was an epic episode we had to cover this topic at some point it's been one of the most requested yes. Right. topics right. the word respected was coming out because it is one of the most respected yeah. stories of the indian journey so thank you sir we link all your books down below your handles down below any signing of notes thank you a lot and uh, you know it is uh, it's a it's a kind of an opportunity where it's you know open ended yeah one can say what you have in your mind and uh, therefore maybe um it was all rambling thoughts no it's great but this is, uh, this is how history should be taught yes i th- i think uh, you know some points are there which uh, may be useful and uh, i think this conversation this uh, kind of focus on history our own history not to talk about philosophy law there's uh, again all these other subjects are very important for yeah. us and uh, we have to sort of sharpen that and go back and you know tell our generation that we have this history learn from it yeah you know it's, it's not it's definitely the second most important thing for me because the most important thing for me is to find a good tamil girl for myself <laughs> so <laughs> that you know is right and for that you have to know tamil history you know <laughs> so she is going to throw at you sangam poems and then you have to reply so 
ठीक है व्हेन वी हैव टाइम आई आई कैन टीच यू सम सम ऑफ दिस ट्रेन मी आउटसाइड ऑल राइट रैग्स ओके थैंक यू गुड सो लर्न अ लॉट थैंक यू थैंक यू ऑल थैंक यू लॉट सो दैट वाज द एपिसोड फॉर टुडे इन द सेम वे दैट आई लव the scientific conversations the health conversations i feel history is another subject that never feels like something i'm studying never feels like something that's getting dragged it's just a bunch of really cool stories based on things that have actually happened things that have shaped up our present day and when it comes to indian history it's such a thick dense subject that i feel there's no limit to how much you can cover so please give me suggestions when it comes to topics related to indian history and give me guest suggestions as well I'm open to shaping up TRS in the way that you think is best. Whatever the viewers or listeners say will be done by Ranveer and the TRS team. Lots of love. Keep supporting. Jai Hind.